Uh, so welcome and thanks everyone for joining us uh, from around the country today for this week's Pro Perspective, uh, the Insider's Guide to All Things CRE. I'm your I'm your co-host today, uh, Matt Kors. I'm the Western Regional Director here at Crexy. Um, and today we're zoomed in with Brett Hatcher and Gabriel Coe of Marcus and Millichap, um, the, the Hatcher uh, group at Marcus and Millichap. I'll do a quick intro on both of you guys and let's just get right into it because I know people are uh, people are interested here. We got to talk about today. Um, so Brett, you've been with Marcus since 2006, uh, currently serving as senior managing director of investments uh, for the Hatcher Group. Uh, and in this time, um, successfully brokered over 300 transactions, totaling over 1.7 billion. Um, that, that's a lot of deals. And from what you guys are telling me, it sounds like there's, there's a lot more on the horizon this year too. Um, expert in all things ground up and lease up, Brett's up to date in all aspects of self storage from management ops, uh, market conditions, capital markets, and economic trends affecting the industry. So I think I'm um, looking forward to, to hearing about that uh, a lot more so today. Um, and, and definitely received a lot of awards, it looks like, and accolades um, from your success, including National Achievement Award every year since 2015, a seven-figure club since 2014, and the Chairman's Award the past two years. So just to name a few up there. Um, and Gabriel Coe, Senior Vice President of Investments uh, with the Hatcher Group at Marcus and Millichap. First four years with Marcus, he sold over $700 million in self-storage transactions, uh, representing properties in 29 states. Uh, again, I was looking at your inventory, guys. It looks like you're doing deals from, from coast to coast. That doesn't look like it's stopping uh, anytime soon. Uh, Gabriel is ranked second within the National Self Storage Group in 2019, uh, and ranked top 10 since 15. So, in the uh, you know, obviously a lot uh, a lot going on with both of you guys. So, really excited to kind of hear um, what what you've got going on today. Uh, thanks both of both of you guys for joining us. Um, and then real quick logistics again for anyone that just joined us there's a Q&A box and a chat feature so if you can ask questions to the Q&A box it's going to ping me directly uh, but either way we'll get to your questions in, in as real time as possible uh, but thanks again guys how's, how's everything going today all, all good in your world wonderful wonderful you definitely can't complain with uh, the way the market's been reacting uh, over the last six months compared to a lot of product types so uh, it's exciting you know, we didn't talk about self storage a lot when I first began. Nobody really cared, and uh, it's definitely a different uh, situation these days. Yeah, and thanks for having us, Matt. We're also uh, the fortunate position in the Midwest to, uh, you know, to be back in the office, you know, to some capacity. So uh, it's um, a definitely, uh, you know, fortunate position that we gotta recognize, you know, um, absolutely throughout the process. For sure, we're in the same boat here. We're kind of a skeleton crew, uh, but it feels good to be to be coming in and you know, getting back to work, if you will, in, in an office environment. I hear you loud and clear there. Um, why, why don't we get right into it? You know, Brett, if you want to maybe start because you kind of mentioned it there, just you know, your background of getting into CRE, but also like your pathway into self storage, because because as you mentioned, um, it's it's probably pretty hot right now, but you know, maybe uh, you know, so long ago, maybe not so much. Yeah, yeah, no, it, uh, so it goes back, I got into commercial real estate in 06 uh, through a buddy of mine who was with Marcus and Millichap selling apartments. Um, okay. And, and I came in and met him and met the manager, Scott Prisville at the time. And, you know, it's all commission, high risk, high reward. I love it. You know, I, I play baseball. So I'm like, I'm, I'm all about the harder you work, the more you make, the more, you know, the more successful you can be. Um, so I started out in apartments for about two months and I looked around, there's eight guys selling apartments. And I said, I want a niche. Like I want, so I asked Scott, I said, can I sell mobile home parks? And he said, there's a guy already selling mobile home parks. And he said, but you can try self storage. Uh, so looking back today, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. I mean, apartments are a great product type, very safe. However, you look at self storage and kind of the resurgence, the surgence that it's had, not resurgence, but the surge it's had in popularity, it's been a, a great product type. You know, you look at when I got in in 06, it was booming, but not everybody knew about it. And then there was, you know, simply self storage was buying a lot, looking to go public. You had, you know, a few handful of buyers that were trying to grow their portfolio. And, and then by the time I kind of figured out what was going on in seven, I sold my first big portfolio. I was like 20 some million. And then Bear Stearns, the rest, you know, the recession hit. And, and I was kind of naive enough to think that we, because I continued for about six months to close stuff. And I was like, oh, like self-storage is different. You know, it isn't going to have the big downfall that, that everything else did. And not that it had a huge compared to the rest of the market, 
but you know, everybody fell in, in the recession and I sold a lot for the bank in eight, nine, 10 and the beginning of 11. And then in 12, we started to come out of it. Um, and really since then, since six to, you know, 16, I think it peaked and it's kind of fluttered at the top. And uh, it's been a great run six sixteen. I think we might be in the hottest market. It might be hotter now than it was in 16. You know, a little wow. bit of the debt is, you know, rates are just down, capital is moving in. So it's been a good run, um, you know, on, on getting into it. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to hire Gabe. I knew his brother, Nathan, who's on the team now, but uh, nice. Gabe wanted to be an intern. And, and uh, Gabe came in and, and it was a great intern and then has been a, a very successful partner in our team. And uh, I'll let Gabe kind of give his background and when he came in and kind of the thoughts and the feels he had and where he's kind of grown it because Gabe's been, you know, some part of it, I, I kind of came naive to the growth that self storage could possibly have. Um, and, and when Gabe came in, it kind of came a fresh eyes on it where honestly he was naive enough to price things a little bit more aggressive and grow the team and, and do some things. Oh, oh there, I had a yeah. talk of it. And, and, uh, and do some things which allowed, which allowed the team to grow. And, and, you know, one of the first deals that he did, I was like, ah, this is too aggressive. The price they want. Sure enough, we got full list price came in. And I said, maybe it's good to see a different set of eyes. You know, it was a little bit more aggressive. Coming out of the recession, I was so pessimistic on so many things. Gabe came in with this, like, everything is green. The only, you know, rents go up, everything is great. <laughs> And so I'll let Gabe take over and tell him like kind of his experience coming in uh, from internship to where he is today. Yeah, thanks guys. And, and that's exactly, uh, you know, it. I mean, when you start in 2014, um, you know, coming from intern and you know, getting ready to, uh, you know, you know, essentially ride, ride his coattails. Um, I, I was fortunate, in, uh, you know, Brett built, you know, an incredible blueprint. Um, you know, I stumbled on, I stumbled probably 2014, arguably probably one of the biggest growth years, you know, that the industry's had. And it's just doesn't seem like it's slowed down since, you know, so, um, but, you know, I've been, uh, you know, very fortunate that he, he kind of gave me the blueprint, but also gave me the kind of freedom and um, I guess encouragement to, to kind of look at things in a new perspective and you know, call markets uh, you know that we normally never would be calling, and, uh, and then that kind of led us to start expanding. Um, you know, from you know Brett and I to you know about ten or eleven brokers we have on our team now, um, all of which have had tremendous success, and you know, continuing to grow year after year. Um, but yeah, I mean, really, it just started. Um, you know, you know, intern out of college, and um, and, and really just pounding the phones, you know, day in, day out and kind of figuring out as I went. So, um, you know, it'll teach think, you, it'll teach you pretty quickly. I think right. you, I, I think you touched on a good part, Gabe, and, and the team part of, of what we kind of grew over the years was, you know, it was Gabe and I, and then we, we kind of grew and the back office grew and we built this blueprint and, and a lot of our, and to give you a background on our team, uh, we're, we now are going to be at 10 brokers in our office and, and well, actually nine in our office, one in Indian and three in Palo Alto. But the majority of the people are in our team, see me every day, see Gabe every day. And we're really close knit. And that's why when we were talking about being back in the office, we've been back in the office since mid May, we've had one case, we had to leave for a week and we were back in it and we've been safe ever since. And so it, it, having the camaraderie of our back office, our team, we've been full strength. Life hasn't changed essentially uh, and that regards knock on wood since July, I'm a little right. nervous with some of the cases that are spiking right now. I think football season's upon us. People want to go to the bars and watch it. I'm a little nervous on where we are. So we got to be careful out there, but, but I think it's been great for us to be back and, and have our team camaraderie. And that's, what's helped us to grow and our pipeline that we have right now, which is above anything we've ever had. I think the market's as hot as it's ever, we'll get into that, but, uh, but that's a little background on game myself, our team, uh, and, uh, Oh, that's awesome, guys. And and we had uh, kind of an early question come in that I was going to wait a little bit to ask, but I think it kind of makes sense just from hearing both of your aspects of it. Like barrier to entry, do you see, is it a big barrier to entry if you wanted to, and they didn't really specify, but get in as a broker right now, like let's say you wanted to get in today versus 06 or 14, like when, when you know, when, when yeah. you guys got in the business? Well, I think 06, 
to 09, you could have walked in the door and the heartbeat you could have got a job. I, I think you are in one of the more competitive times on the brokerage side. Um, you know, we've, we've seen the one thing I will say, there's not a lot of loyalty in the sense of some, you know, I don't want, you know, a lot of sellers are, I don't want to sell. I don't want to sell. And then one day something happens and that person yeah. calls and gets lucky. Um, so there's not a ton, but there is, I mean, there, there is a decent amount of okay. people who have relationships when you have guys like myself and, you know, we have other brokers in Marcus and Milicep who have relationships that with, with theirs and at Cushman and that, you know, Skyview and all the other ones. And so, it is a little bit tough on the brokerage side to get in, but if you've got the understanding, you've got the willpower, there is opportunity uh, out there. But in the in regards to the the getting into the market as a new owner, as a developer, mm -hmm. it is it is kind of the same thing. It is one of the hardest markets to tap that we've seen in the last fifteen years, just because self storage is it's so hot. You have office and hotel right. that are retail that are kind of floundering a little bit. There's more, our airspace has never been more crowded and, and that's a good thing. And, and there, there's always opportunity regardless. It shouldn't be one of those, no, there's nothing at all. But I mean, there is, self-storage is gonna continue to grow. I'm afraid we're gonna get too much, too many people in the airspace and grow too rapidly and develop too rapidly. And it won't, we can't last here forever, but it is a good run. It's been a great product type, but definitely one of the hardest markets to tap into uh, in recent history. Yeah, and, and just just to piggyback off that, I mean, you, you know, firsthand you see it, you know, from from you know calling, you know, calling being a green broker, you know, knowing nothing about the industry, you know, in 2015, um, versus you know, you know, knowing what you know, knowing what I know, but still, you know, continuing to call the market and build relationships. I mean, you know, you can see you can see the crowd, you know, you can see the saturation. I mean, there's more information out there than ever. Arguably, there's probably 10 times as many brokers calling now as I was in 2015. I always say how wow. fortunate okay. it is. You know, that doesn't mean, you know, obviously all this is, you know, happening because of how much opportunity is out there. There's also more data, you know, than there ever has been. There's a lot more people with access to everybody's, you know, all the property owners and all their names and, you know, through, you know, sites like Yardy Matrix and, you know, countless of others. So I think the learning curve and the data curve has kind of changed the game you know, quite a bit since about 2015, um, you know, to make it, um, you know, I'd say the barrier to entry, you know, in theory lower, but the barrier to entry of having high success, obviously a little harder. Right. Okay. No, that makes a lot of sense. And thanks for kind of clarifying that guys from, from both your perspectives. Um, you know, to get into it, cause I, I'm sure I have these questions. So I'm sure other people do too listening, like kind of more or less the fundamentals of self storage. I mean, it, you guys want to get into some different like factors regarding location, size, things along those lines affecting the properties. Cause I, I was again, just on your site a couple of days ago and saw that you guys are everywhere. Right. So it's not like you guys are focusing in, in Ohio where you're at. I saw you have deals coast to coast. Um, but what are some different factors that you, that, you know, are taken into consideration from, from what you guys do on a day to day? Yeah, I, I guess too, maybe a little bit of education on, self storage yeah. for anybody who's new to it a little bit is is to talk through the a b and c properties the size of the property so i mean when you're looking or the markets too i mean an a market is pretty simple pretty simple you're talking core market you know you're in nashville you're in new york you're in miami you're in dallas and raleigh when you go into the that's a and when you're in the b you know that's 30 minutes outside of raleigh that's 30 minutes right. outside of nashville but it's a, you know, a still a quality asset and we'll get into quality here in a second. And then see, you know, there's 15,000 people, 25,000, 30,000 people within five miles. Um, and when I get to that tangent on the mileage, just cause I'm thinking of it, typically self storage is looked in one and three, one and three miles of, as you're going to be your pool, especially A and B. When you get into C, you're going to get into the five mile. But when you're looking at your demographics, one and three are like the most important thing. And the other thing wow. is on, okay. on a saturation is typically seven square feet per person is pretty much average. If you're in Florida, it's going to be a little bit, you know, you can get a little bit higher because you don't know, basements versus, you know, Ohio. So there is a little bit of wiggle room in that, but seven is a pretty good bar to set. When we look at, you know, A, B, and C of the quality, you know, A, your climate, your non-climate, you have an office, sometimes you're multi-story, you're fenced, you're gated, you're asphalt. Everything is newer. It's I would say it's in 15, 15 to 18 years. 
that is a okay. you know so when i'm talking hey you're in nashville you got the big multi-story you know or you're in you know san francisco you have a multi-story that is an a plus a plus you know when you look to the b you know it may not have a lot of climate control the office is a little bit smaller they're just older buildings a little bit more they might still going to be gated fence still going to be um, you know, a, a quality asset, but it's not going to be like, oh my gosh, that's a trophy. You know, it's just like a nice asset um, in there. And then when you get into C, you're talking no gates, you know, it, it can be, sm and I'll get to the size too on the A, B, and C, you know, you're talking no gates, no office, you know, that, you know, it's gravel, uh, that would get into the C type properties. But when you look at size, I think one of the greatest fundamentals for understanding for anybody who doesn't know self-storage or newer to self-storage is we don't look about units we look at square footage because you could have you know you could have 800 five by fives and you could you could really be a small facility so really we look on square footage you know and a typical square footage where we like to see this 60 to 75 thousand square feet that is the bread and butter that's institutional grade anything above that is great as long as it's warranted we've seen a lot of them get because okay. at the end of the day your first 40 thousand square feet 35, 40,000 square feet, pay your expenses. Your next 10,000 square feet or 5,000 square feet, you know, give or take what market in, pay your mortgage. And then everything on top of that is gravy. That's your rate, that's your cash flow. Oh, okay. So when you look at those smaller facilities, you can still make them work, but you got to manage them by yourselves or you can't have a full-time manager. I'm talking more of the institutional grade, which would be A and B type properties where you have a manager 40 hours a week, you know, and, and that size and above. And that's when we're seeing a lot of the development in today's market is they're building the property. You know, they look at a property and they say, oh, you know, it's 75,000 square feet. It doesn't really look like a good return. Well, let me add two more floors on it. Now we're 110,000 square feet and my cash flow just got bigger. But the problem is you got to understand that you still got to make the saturation in the market. It's going to take longer to fill. It's going to take longer to carry. Because right. when you look at the fundamentals of self-storage, it's probably one of the longest lease up risks you have in real estate. You build a strip center, you put in your power anchor, you put in your small, you know, in line. Right, right, right. You look at apartments, you're six months to a year to fill it up. You look at hotels, it's just as quick. Well, it was just as quick before, but self-storage, it's typically a year, at least a year to get it entitled and out and built and open the door. It's typically a little bit longer. And they used to say 18 to 24 month lease up. Now we're looking... 24 to 36 month lease up. So if it took you a year to build and 36 months to, to fill it up, some of them even going a little bit farther than 36, you're a four year window where you're vulnerable to like the market recession, the market hit, the market movement. Right. And so that's the scary part on self storage. The beauty of it is when this does get rolling, you get, it, it, it just stays flat. You know, once you get these things stabilized, mm -hmm. they are the cash cow that everybody speaks of. And so that is that is the beauty of self storage. That's what gets people all excited because if you get a property that's eighty five percent full, hey, if things go down, you're going to seventy five percent. If things are great, you're ninety percent, and it just gives and takes. Where you you know it's not where you know I'd law you know Walmart goes out of your strip, your inline center, and all of a sudden you can't pay your mortgage or half your office building leaves you know and that type of thing. So when you do get to the stabilized portion of it, it's phenomenal. Um, and I'm t talking too much. I'm like Gabe, take over, and <laughs> Gabe, you can talk on anything you might think of and, and the fundamentals of self-storage. Well, yeah, we I think one you know, quick the question come is, in too. The Absolutely. one thing I'll, I'll piggyback is, is just, you know, the kind of the point you were making is, you know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the headwinds that, you know, you know, some of the markets have seen and, you know, we'll continue to see is, um, you know, that you know, everything, you know, looks better on a spreadsheet if you build it bigger, you know, and, you know, when markets <laughs> are saturated, um, you know, every, you know, if you're ignoring the competition and the demand, demand in the market, obviously all things being equal, you're going to build that sucker as big as you possibly can. Some markets have, uh, had a little many two developers, obviously pushing the envelope, um, you know, with, you know, a lot of optimism and, you know, we're still waiting to see some of that absorb. Um, but I, right. I think the biggest focus that I've, I've seen since, you know, I've started is just you know, paying attention to, saturation in the market three and five like brett originally said and really you know dialing in i mean looking at so many of these three mile radius five mile radius i mean you're starting to see 20 25 square feet per capita in some of the southeastern markets where you know the the, the gold rule was always seven you know so i think the demand is you know adjusting to that and i think more people are 
you know, you know, very slowly, you know, you know, you know, looking to, uh, to rent storage, but you know, you're never gonna compete. You know, you know, you're never gonna be able to catch up when you, when you start tripling the demand in, in a market, no matter how much the population is, you know, exploding with growth. That's, that's a lot of good intel, guys. I was not aware of, aware of much of that. Um, we, we had a couple questions come in. So the first one I was going to throw out there, just when you say square feet, is that is that leasable square feet then? So that, you know, 65, 75,000, that's leasable uh, in yeah. the units? Yeah, yeah, it absolutely is. Hallways, hallways don't generate any money or, you know, <laughs> elevator chat, any elevators, office, like that's truly your actual units when we look at that. Layouts will vary, but... Oh, sorry. I was going to say, uh, you know, typically on average, you, you know, you're going to get 70 to 75,000. I mean, 70 to 75 percent of the gross footprint. Would you agree, Brett? Yeah, I'd say 75. I mean, it depends on your hallways. You could be almost at 80, but 70 to 80, depending on how big of hallways you have, or if you have drive aisles or, you know, like if you have a drive through, but 70 to 80 percent is typically the is the efficiency rate on a multi-story or with an interior climate control, like mostly building. So you're a hundred thousand gross, you know, properties are okay. you're really, you know, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, you know, discredit confusion sometimes behind that. Hey, that's really a 70,000, 75,000 rentable, you know, you know, project, you know, when, when some of these developers are looking at, you know, the footprint. Okay. Okay. Um, no, that's good. And then a couple are, you know, back of questions here that came. Um, what is the the return on investment on these? So the ROI on these, and is that your standard kind of cap rate equation, or is that something different here, like a gross revenue multiplier or something? We're looking on a cap rate basis. Um, okay. And and I think when you look at the Class A stuff, it is. I mean, your cap rate is basically around a six, maybe in the low fives, depending on if you're in a core market. Could be in the mid five, especially with rates. So I mean, if you're borrowing at three and a half you're getting a five and three quarter cap rate, you get a pretty good cash flow. I mean, a lot of investors who are looking on that quality asset are typically, and a lot of new syndicates have come out. We have a lot, we've never seen as many funds, private equity funds out there chasing deals. I mean, it used to be a couple of them with a hundred million dollars was like, you had to get to know them really well. Now there's a dozen, I mean, there's probably two dozen out there with uh, private equity, you know, family offices type of money out there. And they're typically looking an 8% preferred return. They're looking at an 8% return cash on cash. Okay. Um, you know, as, and that's A. You know, as you get the B, you're going to get a little bit closer to that 9 or 10. And as you get to C, you may get into 10 or 12%. I mean, anywhere from that 8 to, you know, 6 to 12 is the return on your, you know, investment uh, on a cash on cash basis. You know, IRRs can can move a little bit in, in regards to whether you're looking at a 5 or a 10-year-old but I've seen it 17 to 27% on that. But I mean, basically everyone's looking at this at a cap rate basis. You know, your A's are going to be, and everybody always has the million dollar question. What are cap rates today? So I, if I had to throw a general paintbrush on, because you don't want me to answer, there's a broker's cap rate, a seller's, a buyer's and appraiser's. But in all reality, when you look at cap rates today, if I had to take a general, I'd say your class A great stuff is, you know, five and a quarter to six and a quarter your B's are anywhere from six to seven and a quarter. And then your C's are seven to, I mean, it could be up to nine if it's really small, you know, if you have 10,000 square feet in the middle of a cornfield, that's not going to sell okay. for, you know, it's going to be a nine, 10 cap. And to give you an idea, prior to me getting in this, pretty much before the early, or the early 2000, like 2003, this was a 10 cap property. Everybody in the nineties, just put a 10 cap on it. You have a hundred thousand dollar NOI. I want a 10% return, you know, it's a million bucks. That's how it used to be. And it's just gained popularity. And now it's the point it's driven cap rates down to almost 50% of what they used to be. Wow. Yeah. And just to okay. add one more thing to that, you know, with the IRR question, cap rate question, you know, obviously as closely related as they are, the, the people who are getting the highest IRRs and the highest cap rates are the people who are buying value add deals, you know, that okay. might not have much of an, a positive IRR you know, year one, sometimes year two. I mean, whether you're buying a development or a lease up or, you know, the fundamentals is, you know, you buy the mom and pop who's operating nowhere near what, you know, the, the true potential is of that facility. And, you know, when you hear stories of what, what's the highest IRR, what's the highest cap rates these guys are getting, it's, it's because they've, you know, maybe bought it at a low cap rate, low IRR, and, you know, got, you know, added enough value to the facility <laughs> 
you know, we, we've seen, you know, we've seen the 20, you know, 20%, 25, 30%, you know, returns, um, but that's not something people are, are, are stumbling upon, you know, day one. I mean, that's, that's, you know, they're really cranking the revenue um, and cranking the operations on these properties. Which is, which is the beauty of self storage is it, it's, it's kind of like a business. It's not just a passive investment and it's just more of like a, it's a business where you can move the dial. So that's the beauty of that value add. And, and to be honest, most of the cap rates we're selling off of, um, you know, we're selling that growth and people are buying that growth. I mean, people look at some of the cap rates and scratch their head. Why would somebody ever buy a three cap, you know, in, in a B market, you know, it's because there's, um, you know, and, and knowing the difference is also important of, of how much upside there really is. But, you know, people are buying deals that are, you know, year one, year two through lease up or, or buying deals that are, you know, so, so greatly mismanaged that, you know, they can, right. they do have the opportunity to get that to a seven or eight cap pretty quickly. That, that's a lot of good stuff, guys. We, we got a bunch of questions. I feel like I'm on the, uh, the, the, the lightning round with Kramer right now. So <laughs> to, to, to get into kind of like what you were mentioning on buying deals versus developing deals, right? So is, is there still a good market for developers that are looking to purchase shovel-ready projects, permitted land, and, and you know, ready to go there? Um, I guess, what would you say about that? I'm sure it varies market to market, but... It, 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 it certainly does. I mean, that's obviously uh, does, definitely. But when you look at the development, look at the price that self storage has been selling for. It has gone through the roof. All of a sudden, you, you know, the pro, the cost of development has gone up significantly. So don't get me wrong. You used to build a property for, you know, a typical single story property used to build it for 30, 35 bucks a foot. Now you're looking 60, 65 bucks a foot. The multi-story used to be in 65 to 80 bucks a square foot. Now you're 85 to 110 a square foot. You, it, it depends on how elaborate you make those multi-stories. So you look at what these are selling for though. And all of a sudden you're selling for 150 a foot and it takes, you know, you're like, I can build that single story for 60 bucks. So the developments I think is going to make a resurgence. I just wrote an article about it. I think you're going to see a resurgence of development because the stabilized stuff is so expensive and it's older and you know, you, you don't know what you're inheriting. So I think the development opportunity is there. Um, I, you know, shovel ready like sites, are few and far between, mainly because okay. if they're if they're good, if, if somebody's really in, has done their due diligence and it's a great site, they're going to build it. So mm -hmm. it, it it rare that someone says I'm having a partnership issue or I don't have the capital to do it, but I got a great site. That happens, but it's not as often as you think. And you know, back About to like that million dollar, you know, that magic number is is you know back to barrier to entry. You know, yeah, what is the square footage per capita and why is it the way, you know, there, you, you know, when you have 20 square feet per capita, 25, it's usually because there's zero barrier to entry. I mean, you know, when, when you're looking at, you know, should I buy an existing facility or should I build, um, you know, that's obviously the first place you got to look. And, you know, the people who are making the most money building and, you know, they're taking the least amount of risk are the people who are going after the high barrier to entry markets and you know that value is created from the site selection and getting the you know permits and the approvals. So on on the flip side of that, how about like big boxes going dark? Is there a way that you'll see those becoming self storage, or would there be an oversupply if if that was to happen with you know every big box tenant going dark and going self storage? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you've already you've already seen some of that development be going on by the last five years, especially when Kmart went okay. dark. We saw a lot. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing you've got to understand, and I think we're going to see uh, we're going to see that expand. I think you're going to see that happen more and more. But I I caution everybody who's doing this. I have not seen many conversion deals I love because typically, and I think it was one of the guys at Public Storage. If Target can't make it in that location, doesn't mean self storage can make it in that location. So if it's a dying retail market and it's a dying area, and they can't backfill it, self-storage climate control rental rents aren't typically that high. So you have to be very, very careful. I do see that there could be an opportunity in the future because I think we might see so many go vacant that you might be in a good corridor where it's just overbuilt retail. And they say, you know what? There's already the Hobby Lobby went out, the Kmart, you know, all, the, all of them went out. And you say, you know, we can, nobody else wants to get into this overbuilt retail area, but it's still a good location. They still have good population. So I think you're going to see more and more of that come along, but I cautious all investors when they're looking at that to make sure the saturation is not only correct, like Gabe said, 
but your renters, like is your renting demographic, can they afford $130 for a 10 by 10 versus a $79 drive up old crappy unit because they don't care. They're just trying to get their stuff out of their garage. They don't need a climate control. You didn't pay an extra 40%. So be very cognizant of that when you're looking at each development on a deal by deal basis. And I, and I challenge you to talk to Gabe or I or any broker or any consultant when you're looking at this because getting a second set of eyes on it. And I've looked at some before and I'm like, I don't like this because you're pulling from this demographic. You have a great population, but the highway cuts this off and this area isn't going to be paying the high rent. If you're okay with this area, it's bringing all the people paying the lower rent and you speculate the lower rent. Good. Go for it. If not pull, you know, pull off of this one. But so it's always good to get a second look at these because it can seem like, Oh, I buy it for X. It doesn't cost me as much. I don't have to worry about site work, but it, there is a lot of things that go into it. So you have to be careful. Yeah. And, you know, we've sold, you know, we've sold probably five or 10 conversion deals a year. Um, you know, by that meeting, their existing storage properties that, you know, had been converted. We see, um, you know, probably 50 to 70 proposals a year of people, you know, asking, hey, can this conversion deal work? And, you know, a lot of them, you know, a lot of them, a lot of them don't. I, I mean, no matter how low that, you know, that, uh, construction costs might be compared to a ground up development. Um, you know, you know, what Brett has pointed on, um, it, you know, it, it usually, um, struggles, uh, to lease up at the same rate as some of these new class A facilities. And, you know, not only is it struggling to lease up as fast, but, you know, they're struggling to obtain the same rental rates that we're seeing for, you know, the traditional, you know, brand new class A, you know, self-storage property. Because I will say on that development, people need to understand if somebody's getting $100 for a 10 by 10 and they're full and you build 60, 70,000 square feet, you have to come in at $90. What do you think they're going to do with their rent? When they lose a couple of renters, they're going to go to $85. And so the rent will trickle down. Mm -hmm. That's why we see most of the new developments anywhere from 20, really like 15 to 40% below what the market was the day they read that they did the study. So you have to be careful and under, understand those rents will drop. They won't drop forever, but it's going to take you time to get them back to where that market was. And again, that goes back to the saturation, what's being built in the market. On the, on the other side of that question, because this, this just came in too, what are the drivers for self-storage users? So the people that are using it, and, I, and I'm just thinking to myself, because I, I live in a, a tiny apartment in Los Angeles and my wife is throwing my toys away left and right. Uh, she won't let me get a unit, but how about like, I'm sure that varies market to market, but what are you guys seeing right now from that side? Yeah, no, it's it's very interesting. First off, congrats on the Dodgers then yesterday. That was uh, <laughs> a fun game to watch. <laughs> Luckily, they didn't have to go to Game Seven with COVID with right. uh, with the COVID situation. But um, <laughs> when you look at the renters and and different market, it does really vary. I mean, the best renters you can get are commercial tenants. You know, if you get a, you know a restaurant that needs overflow for some of their equipment, if you get a tanning okay. salon that has extra stuff, you know, drywall. Those are the best ones you can possibly have. I, you know, when you look at, you know, Manhattan, you can do smaller units. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be the, we're all ordering plastic junk, but those mm -hmm. aren't the, those are more transient renters. The best renters I have found, especially in the more rural areas, not in like the downtown LA, Miami, Dallas, Denver is the two car garage. It's the two car garage rule. The two car garage, okay. you know, one turns in, one side turns in to the storage unit and then your car's outside. So those are some of the best I, population is the most important thing. You know, a, you know, a lot of the REITs like to see 180 to 300,000 people within three miles, you know, depending on the market, you know, they want to see that population you need the density because of the population to rent, because that's the most important driver of what it is, because typically 75% of to 75, 60 to 75% are going to be residential. And then that, you know, that remainder are going to be commercial. Um, but it is, it's the patio furniture that's coming in, you know, it's that cleaning out the garage for the winter. It's, mm -hmm. you know, I've cleaned out my back room, I, but I want to keep this stuff, you know, where grandma died and I don't want to throw her stuff out yet. It's that type of stuff. And, you know, the oh, movement, yeah. you know, the, the population movement is going to be the big differentiator market by market. I mean, you're always going to have, you know, markets you know, similar when it comes to, you know, the death, divorce, you know, loss of job, but, the big thing that is going to fluctuate, you know, 
you know, where you are and also what's happening, you know, in the economy is movement. You know, I mean, we're seeing more movement from our population than ever before. Um, and that is something that is going to be, you know, should be highly paid attention to, you know, when you're talking about, you know, population decreases somewhere, you know, some places in the Midwest and the Northeast and, you know, the growth you're seeing, you know, migrate to the Southeast and Southwest and, you know, different markets are obviously going to have different, you know, nuances, but, you know, population movement and, and tr population trends is going to be the big part of that. Absolutely. No, that, that makes a lot of sense, especially with what's going on in the world today. Um, one other question came in for you to clarify something, and I, I, I might have missed this, but uh, can you clarify the $7 per square foot metric? Are you saying there should be the leasable square footage per capita within the one to three mile radius of the property? I may have missed yeah. that one. Yes, yes. correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when we look at, you know, we look at the population and you have within the one mile ring, how big is our population and how much square footage we have in there? And we should try to be, I like to see stuff under seven. So like two and three square feet per person, you know, then it's looking really good. You know, there, there's a lot of, when it's 20 square feet per person, there's a lot of self storage space for not as many people. And again, that will fluctuate a little bit if you're in the Southeast because we don't have basements uh, or, you know, you're in a, in a metro area. How about, okay, so to switch the topic from, you know, kind of about this to more like the management side of things, because I, I think, you know, maybe um, uh, one thought in the industry is this is pretty passive income. And as you guys said, if you kind of get your hands dirty and roll up your sleeves, you can really kind of flip the business around. Um, would you say it is more hands-on versus a passive mailbox investment or mailbox money rather? It is absolutely hands-on if you're going to manage it. There are third-party okay. management companies out there. You know, you have extra space, public storage, keep smart. You know, there's SAM management that's more private. If you have somebody manage, you pay them 6% of your revenue, 5 to 6% of your revenue um, to manage your property, then it is passive. And some of those can actually add value without you getting your hands dirty. But a lot of times you do see the, you know, when someone buys a mom and pop, they actually take over management. A lot of these private equity companies or, you know, these, these regional buyers that are growing nationally, they like to take over the management, be in control of it, control the expenses. You know, your biggest ones are your real estate taxes and your payroll, you know, but those are the most important thing. It's that manager who sits behind the desk. I can't, I can't, I can't push that enough. Having a good manager makes all the difference in the world in a self-storage. If someone just sits there and doesn't care, it's not going to grow. You need somebody who's incentivized to actually think of that asset as their own. So if that, because if the phone rings and they, you don't land the deal or they walk in and they walk out, you're never getting it again. So it's so important to have that management be there, you know, very, very tight. Is it yeah. possible to do that out of state? Would you say it feasible to buy in an out of state area then, or that would, you'd have to have your paying on site management at that point, it sounds like then? Outside no, management, no, unless out you of have. State. Yeah. I was going to say people, I, I mean, people, I mean, majority of our buyer pools, a majority of our transactions are, you, you know, investors buying out of state transactions, you know, just like okay. we're breaking them all, all over uh, regionally, nationally, that's what we're seeing for self storage. Um, you know, it really comes down to, you know, the platform that they've built, the system that they've scaled um, and, and managing people, um, you know, hiring the right people, you, you know, is, 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 is doable, um, but it, it definitely makes it ch more challenging. Um, marketing, you know, marketing platforms um, is, 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 is become just as uh, important as some of the sales, um, you, you, you know, just picking the right manager, you know, obviously the online marketing and web presence becomes as important. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of these, you know, a lot of these guys are doing it more effectively from out of state than some of their mom and pop competitors. But, you know, obviously, um, you know, there's people who, you know, overreach and maybe aren't managing, you know, some of their out-of-state properties as well as they, you know, could be. So, yeah, it's, I mean, the mom, it's the mom and pop site, in my opinion, that can't, that, that stretch and try to run it. If you're a mom and pop and you live in Texas, you want to buy one in Georgia, that's 40,000 square feet. It probably isn't going to work because you really need to be there unless you're going to move there for a little while, get it on the tracks and then right. fly in. But realistically, hiring the management company when they are out-of-state, unless like the big companies that already own in a bunch of states, have that platform already built. So that's why I think that's the most important. And Gabe touched on a very important part is the SEO game 
and some of the online web presence. Those big management companies, when you hire, you know, public storage or, or CubeSmart or X-Space, those people pay millions of dollars to, extra, uh, to uh, Google and to get up there. And so that way you do add an advantage. They do cost more. They cost a lot more to operate than you would because obviously if you operate your own property, that's five or 6% of your revenue that you get to put back in your pocket. But on the flip side, sometimes it's better off to pay them because they can lease your property up quicker or they can manage it more effectively. Nice. Okay. How, if you, when you're looking at kind of like the deals that you guys sell then, how many of them have in place management or is it more or less, is it considered a storage business sale where you're selling the business there too? And, and they're taking it over. I don't know if that quite makes sense, but. Well, I, I think the management in place is the manager in place is 98% of the time. And I mean, there's a manager right there. They okay. stay on the majority of the time. Now, a new management company coming in and overseeing them or a buyer looking at overseeing that manager, that's 98% of the time is what happens. It's if, you know, if Gabe was buying a property off of me in San Jose, you know, and, you know, Sue works at the, the thing, he interviews her, he keeps her on, and then sometimes he can manage it from a distance. He already has the back office platform with the marketing, the office supplies, the credit card merchant fees, and that type of stuff. But you know, we're selling the asset and the and the actually and the manage and the business itself together. I mean, I would say, I would say no more than five percent time do they let the manager go. Most times the manager leaves. If if they, if anybody leaves, the manager leaves. But the majority of the time the manager stays, and that's a big concern for sellers. They don't want to like you know screw over their management manager who's been there who's helped them grow that business. And right, I get right. That. But normally they do stay on and they are happy. But I would say you know. 5% of the time they let him go or the majority of the time, the manager just doesn't want to work for anybody, but the old seller. Hey Matt, to answer part of your question, you know, probably 20 to 25% of the time we're selling deals that have third party management in place, like the extra space, okay. smarts, public storages. Um, but like you said, yeah, you're, you know, you're buying the business. Um, you know, even if you're switching the management, I mean, you're buying those tenants, um, you know, whether you're switching the management style or not, I mean, you know, a lot of that value, you know, like Brad said, was, is, um, is from the business that's, you know, in the, in the income that's currently in place, uh, no matter, you know, what your, your management you know, platform is. And I think, and I think in the COVID times, we've learned that, the, and talk about management styles, Gabe just hit on, there's a few groups out there that there's a big group out of Indiana, big group out of Denver or out of Colorado who has done it. Um, where they don't have managers on site at all. They do call centers and kiosks. It's becoming more popular with COVID, you know, hitting and people moving their managers out. It's becoming even more enticing because they, they realize they can operate, you know, less hours and, and online a little bit more. So that is becoming a new management style that is on its upswing right now. That question just came in, internet management. So interesting. <laughs> Yeah, Red Dot um, Storage, Storage, you know, Storage, Exp yeah, Storage Express at Indiana, Red Dot Storage. And there's a couple other pilot companies that are starting to do the same thing. We're but seeing mom and pop groups, you know, who are, you know, maybe they're only at five or ten. I, I mean, there's, um, you know, at least twenty to thirty smaller groups that you know might not even, you know, come to the front of our mind that are that are shifting and 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 looking to grow pretty, you know, grow with that model in place and. You know, a lot of times you see it with um, a lot of these smaller markets, smaller, smaller um, square footage, you know, properties, you know, they, they start making a lot more sense for the 30,000 square feet and under properties, um, you know, just, you know, because of the, you know, the economics of it. I mean, you know, payroll will eat up, you know, having a full-time manager to, you know, a 20,000 square foot property um, won't be, you know, be almost as expensive as, you, you know, a 60,000 square foot property. So, you know, you really start seeing it, you know, on the smaller size properties, um, you know, first and foremost. You know, another kind of another loaded question I got for you guys, but I'll just try to make it two parter here. So how many units is considered mom and pop? And is there a, a what would you say the medium or minimum or median investment price range would be? And I don't think it has to necessarily relatively be about mom and pop. I part. think, I, I think, again, I go back to the units. I don't, you know, it, it doesn't go back to units because you could have, you know, 60, 10 by 30s and it would be a big facility versus, you know, 65 by 10. So I, I try to shy away from the units and, and, but I mean, if you want me to answer that question, I, I mean, 
Gabe, what would you say on, on the unit size? Well, 150. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily distinguish it as mom and pop versus not because we've seen the a hundred thousand, a thousand, a hundred thousand square feet, 1000 unit, you know, you know, mom and pop properties all day long. So I don't think size should be a clear indicator of whether, you know, it's a mom and pop seller. Um, but to answer your question, you know, the, the properties that are 40,000 square feet and under um, or versus 40,000 square feet bigger, um, you know, that is usually, you know, 40 or 50,000 is usually the cutoff when it comes to, you know, the sophisticated investor buying okay. it, the mom and pop buyer, you know, mom and pop investor buying it. Most, you know, institutional buyers are looking for 40, 50,000 square feet and larger. Um, you know, versus, you, you know, anything, anything below that is, is typically tiered as a different investor class. Um, you know, when it comes to, you know, the size of, you know, of the deal, um, mm -hmm. I'd say average, you know, average we see is 5 million, but I'd say probably average, oh, wow. um, oh. average purchase price for the country might be closer to a million dollars. Yeah, okay. no, I, I would say like, if you're looking at a C property, you're 400,000 to probably 1.2, 1.5. I think if you're in a B property, you're in the range of 1.2 to 3 million, 4 million, you know, like B's get up there. And when you get C's, you're, you're four to 25 million, depending on the market. Okay. But yeah, size, size is going to obviously play, you know, a lot of that, you know, you know, play into a lot of that. Are, are larger company? I mean, I'm assuming larger companies are striving to own the more amount of units, right? I mean, or, or would they go into a, a more saturated market? Like I'm trying to think like maybe like a Seattle or something like that, where there's just not a lot of room and they'll get lower square footage foot or, you know, footprints just to kind of get the foothold in that market to, to try to build up there. Well, I, I think you're, you're, everybody's trying to grow right now in, in a lot of ways, especially the newer companies, but, Yes, in the smaller markets, you can go less. Like you looked at a deal in, in South, you know, in, on Miami. In Miami, that's a smaller size deal, but their rents are three times as expensive as normal. So they don't mind having a little bit of smaller of a footprint. The Northeast is that way. Rents in the Northeast, South Florida. I mean, even we have one under contract right now in the Virgin Islands. And, you know, their rents for a 10 by 10 are 300 bucks. You know, if I went down the road here in Columbus, Ohio today, I could go get one for $89 probably. So okay. they can be a little bit on the smaller size. So there is a little bit of difference, but still typically the, the, the smaller ones, it, it, you don't see as often the big companies, the big companies still want that footprint. Okay. Well, and, and they're sense. looking, you know, in, in some of these bigger REITs, I mean, they're looking at, you know, market, you know, markets with low barrier to entry as well as high barrier to entry. I mean, I, I think, you know, that is not the, you know, the end all be all of, you, you know, you know, when it comes to, you know, investment criteria for them, you know, at the end of the day, they're more focused on the size and the economics of the deal. Um, you know, obviously the economics, you know, are, are different, you know, when there's a low barrier to entry market, but, you know, there's a lot of, a, a lot of the big national players, you know, they're still, you know, actively buying in, in you know, in, 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 in markets that are, um, you, you know, lower barrier to entry, you, you know, you know, maybe 50 to, you know, maybe not the top 25 MSAs, but the top 50 MSAs. Got it. Okay. No, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, man, I'm just trying to figure out what questions we should go to next. There's a lot of them in here and, and anyone okay. that's asking, we'll if we have, don't get we'll to have, them. Yeah, we'll have quick answers. I'll each take <laughs> one, one quick answers. I'll start with the first one. Rapid, round. <laughs> Rapid round here. Um, how do you value acreage for expansion on this? That is a tough one. I, you know, and it all <laughs> depends on, and it all depends on where, what market you're in and how much land, if you're very rural and you've got two extra acres and it's pretty saturated, there's not going to be a lot of value to it. Right. Okay. Got, that makes know, sense. If you happen to be in, you know, in Washington, DC and you, you've built it and you have an extra acre on the side and it can go multi-story, we're talking big money. It's really going to okay. look at just an actual like land development, but the expansion play does help compress the cap rate. It just gives you a little more juice, but it doesn't typically what we look on the expansion plays. If it's just a typical, like I've got five acres, I've built out on four. There's one in the back. I've got a little bit more. We're just going to compress the cap rate a little bit more. We're going to bring it down. We want to raise the price a little bit because maybe in three or five years they can put, or they can put parking on it and they can put in our building on it down the road. 
So it's very, very, it's a deal by deal situation, but it's right. very hard to look at it. Depends on the market you're in. How viable would it be adding self-storage to a larger multifamily project? Typically not very viable. Um, are are okay. you talking about, um, I, I mean, if it's a separate parcel, um, I mean, and, and they have the, the square footage you know, needed for development, um, you know, we'll, you know, that's just, you look at that like any other land play, but, you know, to run it in conjunction with a multifamily project, typically you don't see, you know, the economics making much sense. Um, you know, actually a question we're not used to hearing quite as often as the others though. It's an interesting one. All right. I, 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 it's, yeah. yeah that's it's not one you hear every day. I wanted to, yeah, maybe, yeah. I, I mean, I don't want to, yeah, exactly. You, you know, write that question off too fast, but it's just not really something you see. Usually it's an adjacent parcel um, and that is very common, but you know, that's just like any other land play. Got it. Okay. Okay. Um, is the 65 to 110, I'm assuming they're meaning per square foot to build all in hard and soft costs. Yeah. I, I think you're going to look at that all in hard and soft. You know, because the buildings are still, your steel buildings are going to be like on a single story steel building. You're probably only 30, you're not even 30. You know, you're, you aren't going to be, that's concrete, asphalt, gates, cameras, you know, carry costs, engineering permits, everything that goes into it. I mean, and again, we've seen the subs are up, you know, 40 to 50%. I was just talking with a large developer out of Kentucky mm -hmm. today. And he said his wood cost just for his office in the past year from when he was originally going to develop it till now has gone up 50%. So, I mean, just Whoa. the wood package that you're looking at. So you've got things that are on the rise, but th I think that is truly like, if you're building a single story, you should be all in in that 60, 65. And, you know, and if you're going to build a multi-story, I hate seeing you go over 110 unless it's a really, really big building or they're going to make you spend an exorbitant amount of money to make it look good, but you better get the rents to back it because you need the rents to back that higher construction costs. People will not pay more because there's granite on the countertops or there's, you know, it's all windows. It, the number the top two things that are important to self storage is cost and convenience for a tenant. The, sa the safety is obviously is, is important, but they're gonna worry about the cost and the convenience are the most two important things. When you're building this, keep that in mind. How about climate control? Is how, how does that play into a factor? Is that, is that gonna be location by location? Yeah, some people, you know, some people are gonna pay significantly higher um, and, you know, make it a non-negotiable to rent a climate controlled unit. Usually you see that in, um, you know, the warmer climate, the Southeast, the Florida, you know, where we're in, in Ohio, um, you look at, you look at a climate controlled unit side by side, uh, with your strength, you know, you know, your standard, uh, non, non-climate and most people aren't willing to pay much more. Um, you know, obviously it varies based on supply and demand. But uh, there's a lot less demand, you know, that's specifically looking for climate controlled. Uh, and that's a mistake some people make, you know, when, um, you know, they might be overvaluing, you know, some of the pro forma rents that they're going to get in climate control just because you get the massive premium in other markets. Uh, so that's a market by market, you know, thing where, you, you know, some of these renters are going to not care about climate control. They're going to, mm -hmm. you know, care about cost and convenience and picking the cheapest option. And that's, a, and that's one of the biggest mistakes I see developers make is they look and they say, oh, that public storage down the road, you know, it's been around for 20 years, it's full and it's climate control. And they may only have 10,000 square feet. Then they go build 80,000 square feet, all indoor conversion, self-storage facility, and think that the whole market needs that. And that, that's the biggest misconception is you've got, it's a market by market. You have to understand. And if you don't understand, you need to talk to somebody. And even with feasibility guys, people out there, I get a little bit weary because their job is to give you the green light too many times. And I've seen it happen where, and there are good ones and there are bad ones. And I don't know the difference necessarily between them all, but I think it's important. Gabe and I look at a lot of developments and I have no skin in the game where you build it or you don't. And if I look at it and you say, I'm gonna build 80,000 square feet, that one's full, they're gonna $125 for a climate control 10 by 10. That's great that they're getting that, but now all of a sudden the amount of square footage and climate control you're building is like four times as big. It's gonna take you longer to lease up. It's more expensive, like Gabe said, is it really a, a deal breaker for them to get a, you know, a climate control in the Midwest, you know, the mid plains, you know, no in South Florida, you know, or, you know, in certain markets that's really, really cold. Yes. Yeah. So you got to look at it on a deal by deal basis. Yeah, no, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. And you guys see all that then, right? So you're talking, I mean, you know, what's going on in Southeast, Midwest, West coast, everything along the lines. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're looking at, you know, looking at a portfolio in Manhattan and New Jersey, and it's a totally different okay. ball game. And then you look at it, you know, in, in the middle of Georgia or in the, you know, Mississippi, Alabama. Mississippi an hour later. So, you know, we, yeah. I, I think we hit all, all weeks, you know, of life, all, all markets, all deal sizes. Um, you know, we just looked at this, you know, a week ago. In 2020 so far, we've looked at 600, we've proposed on 600 properties. So, wow. It's, okay. I mean, you, you know, we, you know, we're probably listing, you know, maybe one in 10 of those, you know, at some point, okay. on the road. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, that metric will depend, you know, a lot of times we're proposing on deals that, you know, we might, you know, we might sell five years down the road. Sometimes we're, you know, proposing a deal that, you know, um, you know, that we're, you know, competing to, you know, get the listing, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, when you see that many deals, you, you know, you get the benefit of having a lot of perspective um, and, you know, just, just kind of seeing uh, what to do, what not to do. And, you know, who's, who's having success and in, 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 in what they're, you know, what they're doing, um, you know, to get there. Well, I know we're coming to the top of the hour here, guys, this, this, this day or this uh, session flew by, I can't believe it, but um you know, what, are you guys seeing anything like just touching on COVID and just with what's going on in the times today? Like, it, it, is it after, you know, March, April, May, I'm sure maybe you saw a little downturn, but it, has it all been up and to the right since then? And any any changes happening maybe that you're seeing that, that you know, that you didn't expect or anything like that? I know, Brett, you were in, in the 08, 09, so maybe you could see how that was a little different than, than today even. Yeah, yeah. I, I think our fundamentals are much stronger in today's market than they were. But I, I think when you look at, you know, coming into this year, our outlook was that self-storage is going to continue, like you said, go up and right. You know, COVID hit in March. Everybody kind of shut down mid-March, April, May, you know, most of May. And, you know, deals still got done barely if they were non-fundable. You know, Some of them extended. Very little died, though. Very little died. Most, I, didn't, okay. I don't even know if we had one actually die during it, but they extended it out. When we came into June, July, August, everybody, it's kind of like picked up, picked up the, uh, the slack for that. Like, so we just, I mean, and it's just been bonkers since then. The CMBS okay. market came back, interest rates went down. You know, a lot of sellers are selling right now because they still want to capitalize the, the finding out what, before they find out what happens in, you know, the election. I mean, there, I think that's one of the biggest, you know, and, and whether you're on one right. side or the other, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, obviously capital gains, you know, if Biden does win and capital gains do go up, it will slow right. this market down in the sense of we're having trouble people, we're having trouble convincing people to sell right now and the deals are tight and they're coming at our fee. And and that's before they put another, if capital gains, you know, go up five or 10 percent, add another 10 percent on in taxes they have to pay. Then the real sellers are going to be your death, divorce, partnership issues versus right. I'm selling right now because the market is so good. Cap gains are low. You know, interest rates are down. Tons of capital is out in the market. So we're in a perfect storm. Next week's going to be very interesting to see how it goes. And I still think interest mm -hmm. rates stay down for the long or for the short term, maybe even the long term. I'm still pretty bullish on that. So I still think we're going to be, I think there's a lot of capital that capital is not going to go away. So the demand is going to stay strong. My concern is, is if in the event that capital gains do go up is our supply of new deals on the market will go down, you know, and it, but again, that may drive the value, you know, then the, you know, the supply is going to go down, but the demand is going to stay strong. So we may be able to offset that some, uh, but I'm still very bullish on the market. I think the fundamentals are strong. The banking, the auditing systems are very strong. Um, you know, the development, I think, is going to be the next wave of things that I'm very concerned about. I think we're going to see, I mean, right now in Columbus alone, we have 1.1 million square feet. We have 3.5 million square feet uh, being put on the, in Ohio, because I spoke for the Ohio Self-Storage Association Convention last week on a Zoom call. One, it was $3.4 million or th square feet were being put online. In just Ohio, you know why? It's because in Florida, Raleigh, Dallas, Denver, some of the markets that have been oversaturated, they're looking for places to go, and so they're looking for places to go. So they're they're moving in these Midwest states because they just need something. They want to keep building. So I think the development is going to be ramping up really hard, uh, and it makes me a little bit concerned. But they may put more deals on the market that may hurt some people who already just built and are leasing up. But I think that's going to be what's uh, our biggest headwind is going to be development and at capital gains. But other than that, I'm very, very bullish on the self-storage market. It's been the best product type, and, and uh, I, I think it's going to be on a good run. Nice. Nice, man. 
Um, we, there's a couple other questions out here and, and anyone that we can't get to, um, you know, Brett and Gabe, I'm going to give you guys a list of all these so that they'll be able to get to you guys, um, after the fact, um, I, I'll, I'll ask a couple of these here. Do you ever have one master lease on an entire facility considered a single tenant? I've seen it. I've seen it. Been, I've seen a property been sold as a triple net lease. Never wow. have we, okay. never have we done one. I, uh, Brett, have you? No, people are trying to make this a new thing. I don't think it is a possible thing. We looked at one in Utah, um, and I think it was more of a land play of anything, but I've seen some people try to pull this off. I don't think it's going to be the wave of the future, but and I'm still I'm still keeping my mind open to it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's okay. almost goes in the category of, you know, when you see a property on a 99-year ground lease, you know, I mean, obviously mm -hmm. not the exact same, but, um, you know, for the most part, you, you know, that's not how, you know, the fundamentals of self storage work. And, you know, that's not really, um, you, you know, an investment strategy that that can be emulated in the same way that, you know, you know self storage, you know, you know, can. Yeah, but, no, I hear yeah, what you're saying true. there. I mean, obviously, you know, all deals can, yeah. you know, there, there's, you know, there's all sorts of creative deal structures out there. So, you know, not to say can't be a good, uh, you know, opportunity for somebody. Well, it sounds like this is an asset type where creative deal structures are are definitely liked and 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 known for them. Um, yeah. All right, one one other question here that just came out of the same person: uh, If you have a better management company in place, well-known brand like CubeSmart, etc., do you get better financing as a purchaser or a developer using construction financing? Yes, I mean when you're looking at the CMBS world, I don't think you're necessarily get better you're going to get, you're okay. going to qualify. You're either going to qualify or you're not. So I think that's going to be the main thing you're going to look at is you are going to be able to qualify for it versus if you have some, you know, management company owns four of them and they're in California and they're going to manage your deal in Atlanta. It may be a little bit more shaky, but realistically, if you have a, they're going to make you have a professional, you're either going to qualify or you're not going to qualify. Nice, nice. Uh, well, guys, I know we're, we're up on time here. This, this has been a lot of fun. Um, honestly, this, this is a great one. Um, anything, uh, any last words you want to leave the folks with? How's, how's everything? Uh, uh, yeah. What are you guys thinking for next no, week? I, no, I, who knows, but could change the, could change the industry a lot. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I just want to thank you, Matt and, and, and Craig mm -hmm. for having us on. It, it's, it's fun to talk about. Uh, and it's, it's fun to be able to, because a lot of people call me and say, I want to get in storage. And I don't have time to give them, give, you know, understanding of like all different aspects. What Another is, thing is yeah. seller finance, you know, like I would say seller financing doesn't work that often. If you're getting in, it's new plan on at least putting 20% down, if not 25% down on a property. Uh, that is one thing that we don't get really creative on. I've only had one in my career was in 09. Um, but, okay. and so I would say understand that, but it, I appreciate you uh, having us on uh self-storage is a great product type we'd like to talk about it and and feel free to reach out to us on the hatcher group um and uh i appreciate you having us on again yeah, yeah what's the best way to get in contact with you guys if you want to shout that out and we'll give everyone here um we'll give you guys their, their info too got it. the hatcher at the hatcher group on instagram we can uh we all right give you <laughs> linkedin and you know, phone, phone, you know, phone, and email is obviously. You know, and the Hatcher Group, not is it, it's the Hatcher Group. If you Google the Hatcher Group out of Columbus, it, we're self storage. We're right there. Just email us off the website. We'll get back to you. You know, very quickly. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. You know, thank you to all, all you guys who tuned, tuned in and you know, you know, hearing us out and listening to our, uh, you know, listen, you know, listen to uh, our advice. We appreciate you. I mean, based on the number of folks we had and the questions still coming in, I think we could have gone for another two or three hours, guys. So uh, if, we, if we do this again, we might have to slot off a full after, afternoon. <laughs> I like it. I like it. We'll come back for episode two. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. We'll definitely do that. Um, right. Well, hey, just like uh, just like they said, th thank you guys for joining us. I mean, I know you guys are busy, uh, Brett and Gabe. So thanks so much there and everyone for tuning in today. And um, yeah, everyone be safe out there. And this will be up on YouTube uh, on the Crexy YouTube channel. We'll get that up there once it's done. Um, so if anyone missed anything or tuned in late, you'll be able to see it there as well. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys.